Um, so I guess I, I want to start by um, asking MJ or MG some questions about about exposure labs and about impact. Um, obviously, you know it's it's been a few years since this film has come out, and I'm really curious to hear how how you think about impact um, in your role, and maybe how that has changed over the course of um, your time at Exposure Labs. And, and after you answer, I'll extend that question um, to the rest of the panel too. Within your fields of expertise, what are the ways in which you think about impact, whether that's you know, from a quantitative perspective or um, maybe a more qualitative perspective? Yeah. Um, oh, wow. OK. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. So I um, actually came into this work because I saw Chasing Coral in one of my classes in college where I was studying ecology. And I was like, this is nuts. I want to be involved. Um, and I got to work with Exposure Labs just through like reaching out and getting involved in that way. And I think at the start of my work in the film and impact field, I kind of was thinking like the number of screenings we do, the number of events like this that happen, the number of, you know, more like qualitative like you were, or quantitative like you were saying. But I think as time has gone on, I have gotten to see how impactful what we used to call sort of like small scale impact can be and like small scale events can be because we did things like when the film first came out, they did things like um, we had a campaign called Chasing Brews where people would go, um, the team like Zach and everybody would go to breweries, mostly in Colorado, but um, a couple different ones and just kind of talk to people with like trusted messengers. So, like you go to your local brewery, you, you know, trust the bartender, you have your friends that go there, you're in a safe space and you feel comfortable. Um, and sort of like meeting people where they are and they've, they copied that in a couple different ways through like some schools programs and um, they had a Dear South Carolina tour and I go on all about that. But basically I think how my perception of impact has evolved is that I went from feeling like the more, the number of people that have their eyes on something and the numbers really were important and they are important and they're really impactful. But I think what I've come to realize in my time working at Exposure Labs and working specifically with Chasing Coral and our climate program is that if you have a deeper impact on someone and you bring a message to them, like the corals, for example, they're out of sight, out of mind. If you can make someone understand how a coral bleaching impacts them, if they live in Arizona, if they live in Colorado, if they live in Minnesota, like that has much more of a lasting impact than let's say, you know, you gotta click on the website, which again is great, but like having a deep conversation, meeting communities where they are, like at a brewery or talking to frontline organizers saying, what do you need? What does this movement need? We have this film as a tool. Would this be helpful for you to use as like a capacity building tool so that you can use this to start a conversation in your community? We have several programs now where we um, offer films for folks to take into their own communities and in their own organizations and use them as like a tool to get people talking. And then after the film is over, the, the event is not about the film. The event is about the community and what they see happening climate wise and the solutions that they want. So sort of empowering communities to figure out their own solutions and to accomplish their own solutions through facilitating conversations with film. And I feel like that's where the um, intersection of impact and storytelling is like really exciting to me and I could go on forever, but I'll, I'll stop myself there. Would uh, the other two panelists like to answer the question? Um, sure, I don't know if this is on. Yeah. Okay. Um, Yes, I think that the first time I saw Chasing Coral was at a brewery. I don't know if it must have been a part of one of those events. Um, and I think the collective viewing element of it, kind of like here, um, lends, I think, another element of the impact to it um, because you're, you kind of have the immediacy of the shared viewing experience and we were able to talk about it with other people. It was when I was living in Florida at the time where people's connection to the ocean is um, maybe more immediate than it is in the desert sometimes. Uh, and so I think that was a very, it was a profound impact for me personally the first time uh, that I saw the film. Um, and I think thinking about impact overall, especially for Chasing Coral, the thing that's always stood out to me, and I wanted to ask if, have you met Zach? Yes. He just seems like the coolest person. <laughs> I really want to meet him. Um, I think the impact for me and that the film captures well is that Images, yes, are powerful rhetorically as a persuasive artifact, but even more powerful uh, is, is people's and the emotive element. And I think for the film, identification with Zach and, and his love for Coral is really a lot of the, the pivot, pivotal persuasive power of the film. Uh, it's, it's just really cool to see. And so I think there's that, that personal impact 
than spreading out to the public. It's kind of where the film has its power. I think my perspective is on the impact is coming from like a science having done numerous hundreds, probably thousands now of field surveys, we can get tons of data and results and we can put the in, in incredible charts, but they don't connect to the people. And I think that's the driving power behind documentaries like this, is it puts the information in a way most you know, non-scientists can understand, um, but then there's that connection. You feel connected to Zach's story. You feel connected to the reefs. Um, I could put you know, a graph up and I'm sure almost everybody would not feel connected to it. It's just like, <laughs> what is this crazy looking plot? Um, and I think that's the power of these stories is the science is needed to start driving the things, but it's not the best at storytelling. And through these documentaries, through these people that are willing to tell the story, is where we're going to start seeing a lot of these impacts. Thank you. And I think this is a, a great, um, just to kind of continue on this line of questioning, what we see in this film, right, is a balance of the human story and the, hum and the story about the corals. And it kind of raises some questions about like where we place our empathy for me. Um, so I'm really curious to hear your perspectives on how you kind of see that balance um, in, other, in this and other kinds of um, environmental media. And um, yeah, and, and, and Thomas, I'm, I'm especially interested to hear from you because I know this is your first viewing of this film. Um, so what are, you know, for you, what were some things that you were surprised to see in this film? What are some things that you maybe um, expected to see uh, but didn't see? Um, I was actually really glad to see the technical side of it. Um, I think for some of the stuff I've seen in the past, um, it's just like, oh, look, here's a quarter, here's a change. Um, but to really see that connection of being there, this, for example, let's say like Desert Island with Zach there, every day you start seeing these changes. Um, and over time you start, like he had said, like not recognizing the environment. Um, and taking from like an outside perspective, um, say from here in the desert, um, you hear like, oh, things are changing. But if you can't see, if you're not intimately connected with it, um, you, in my opinion, you don't have you know, as much empathy towards that change. Um, and so some of the previous documentaries I've seen, I felt like didn't really connect the human side of it. Um, for example, you know, let's say like maybe a Blue Planet episode, um, fantastic work, amazing narration, and great job presenting. I'm not knocking it all. Um, but there's not always that human connection to some of those episodes. And so I think having that human element, um, I was very surprised to see um, to the extent that it was. And I thought that was a great um, way to show the impact and show that human connection and how we can A, hurt the environment through personal actions on um, day-to-day lives, collectively as a society, but also how we can then collectively come together and actually help and create good change. Thanks. Um, Jake, I want to ask you this next question because I know that you have done some writing on re-photography and like, one of the big conceits of this film, right, is that there's a problem and the problem is that climate change is really difficult to capture and represent because of the scale that it happens on, because of how slow that it happens, right? Um, and so, what are some of the, I mean, for you, what are some of the affordances and limitations, maybe, of relying on something like um, time-lapse photography or like the before and after image to demonstrate that kind of change? Yeah, to start with the, I guess, the good, and then get to the bad or the, or the complicated. Um, obviously, I think time-lapse imagery or re-photography, which is, re-photography is just, you know, before and after images, basically. Um, they allow the, the condensation of time, which is what's so much, which is what's so difficult to capture and communicate about climate change typically, um, which is slow, um, happens in a lot of different places, carbon you can't see. And so that's why they're so interested in this film and like the urgency to, here's an event we can't capture and condense. And so the affordances is that condensation and its ability to be 
um, I think a few different affordances. Number one is circulation. So it's, it can easy, an image can be easily circulated. A um, you know, two month video footage can be condensed down to a 15 second you know, quick video. So the circulation is really one of the, the main affordances. And then the other one that they talk to the film a lot is emotional impact. So you look at the language that Richard Vevers, who I had forgotten that he was in advertising, um, the language he uses is about uh, advertising and the rhetorical work of advertisers, which is uh, it captures them in the gut. It's, it's emotional. It kind of, um, if we think of, if I can put on my teacher hat for a second, if we think of rhetoric and ethos, pathos, and logos, the rhetorical appeals, um, logic, emotion, and credibility, they're thinking, how does it appeal to the emotional elements of our audience? Um, so that's one of the biggest affordances, um, I think, for re-photography. Um, I think one of the, maybe one of the problems of it sometimes, and I'm sure that Exposure Labs or that Richard Vevers and Orlowski even have run into this, is that when you communicate that to an audience of people, um, they find that, especially with studies, is people sometimes feel they hit uh, against their own limitations and agency to do something about the events that they're, you know, you have this emotional reaction to the image and you say, and you're asking your audience to feel in a way, you know, the, the pathos, but what to do about it. Um, and so I think that can be one of the complex ways that re-photography works is what it's asking your audience to do in addition to what you're asking them to feel. And the doing, and the feeling is clear. Feel, you know, feel empathy, feel motivated, feel, feel sad, but also feel inspired, feel all these emotions, but the doing is sometimes more difficult, um, I think, to connect with re-photography um, in some ways. Would any of the others want to add to that? Uh, MG, I know that like this film and also Chasing Ice rely on some of the uh, some, some of the similar kinds of visual logics, right? Yeah. Um, and um, you know, I think it's interesting to see like the way that this film both centers beauty and ugliness, and you know, that's kind of a, a it, an interesting aspect of environmental imaging as a whole, right? Like we see a lot of these beautiful images that we're supposed to feel, um, you know, bad about, ugliness about. Or there are some things, for instance, in our environment, in our oceans, that aren't beautiful, you know, that aren't as colorful as a coral reef or as cute as a, um, a sea turtle that are much more difficult to maybe represent or gain empathy for. So, um, yeah, I guess I kind of just wanted to uh, pose that to all of you. You know, is that something that, um, how, how do we think about something like that? Like the, the need to uh, appeal to our sense of beauty uh, in order to bring out that empathy? I can start. <laughs> um, that's a really good question. I feel like bringing, corals are kind of easy like to, to make people like because you look at them and they're colorful and they're kind of like, whoa, how does that work? If you're not familiar with coral as an animal or if you're not familiar with ocean ecosystems, you're like, that's crazy. Like it's, and it, I mean, even if you are familiar, it is crazy, they're beautiful. And so it's easy to get people to care, like you said, when it's something that's like visually really stunning. And I think something that's, I guess maybe like working in tandem would be my answer to that question of like, show something beautiful like a coral, talk about how incredible it is, then talk about the zozanthelae, which are those little plant algae that live inside the corals and their their symbionts. Um, because if you're like, guys, you really need to care about these algae, everyone's gonna be like, no, like nobody. You don't look at an algae and think that's incredible. Well, most people don't. But if you can like talk about it and relate it, just in the same way that we have to relate the messages of science to humans, for humans to really connect with it, if you can relate something that's maybe less visible to something that people do love, which is you know. In an ideal world, we would all care about everything equally, and we would all want to save everything, and we would all feel attached to everything. That's just not realistic um, for anybody, myself included, everybody included. But I feel like using beautiful imagery of things that are beautiful and that people connect with, and um, you know, a great example is like the charismatic megafauna, maybe in like Africa. So you talk about like lions, and you talk about elephants, um, but what you don't talk about is like dung beetles, but they all work together and they all live together in an ecosystem. So if you can get people to care, and I'm specifically thinking about the environment here, but if you can get people to care about a facet of something that might be beautiful, I feel like it's easier to then bring them into the fold to be like, you care about this, 
this works with this, and if they don't have each other, they can't function. And so sort of like relating them in that ecological way, setting up an equation of, if you don't have this, you can't have this, so you should care about both of them, and here's what you can do, is kind of like, I don't know how I, how I think about those two things coming together. Because it is hard, like you said, it's hard to show things that maybe aren't as visually pleasing or hard to capture, so. Um, yeah, I guess combining like beautiful imagery with a message and a communication about what's behind it is, a, is an effective way of the scene. Thank you. Um, and uh, I'll kind of extend this to Thomas as well, because I'm curious, like when you are working in choral sites, to what extent are you interacting with images like this as opposed to, um, you know, looking at things under a microscope, for instance? Or... Um, well, some of my most recent work um, was photogrammetry of coral reefs. Um, we would do monthly surveys. Um, we had about 130 colonies, and every month we'd go, we'd do um, some basic, you know, four dimensions, north, south, east, west, and the top. Um, but we also did like 3D uh, models around it to track change over time. Um, and so we use that for a variety of reasons. Um, for our kind of our own personal records, it's I think a photo is a great way to keep a record uh, for people down the road to then have their input of it. Um, if I just take you know a simple measurement of like oh the core is two meters by you know three meters, um, it's kind of arbitrary; it can get lost. Um, but a photo encodes a lot more, um, and so part of the work I was doing was trying to encode as much information as I could about these colonies, um, and that specifically was related to core disease. Florida. Um, so my work with um, photogrammetry, photos, and like long-term records um, is pretty heavy. But partnership with that is the kind of nuance, um, unbeautiful side of science of diligent note-keeping, just tons of numbers, running the models, trying to compare stuff. Um, and so for my line of work, I find I found that a balance between keeping it entertaining enough for yourself and finding the beauty to keep going and then keeping those records but then partner with the more abstract and taking the human emotion out of it to be objective to be like okay what what are we seeing um, do I have any personal biases going to this um, and it's very hard to take the personal biases out when you do visit some of these core colonies and you know three months it's looking beautiful and then suddenly one month you have 10 percent core death um, and it's hard not to feel biased and then be like, oh, is it you know, actually 10%? Um, is it not you know, 30%? I think that emotional connection you start getting from this work, in my opinion, kind of bias used towards more of the extreme. Um, and that is the part coming towards these photographs again, is to kind of have a check and have other people come and check it. Yeah. I think you bring up a really... Um interesting point about like the emotions that go into this. I mean, this movie was obviously an emotional roller coaster in a lot of ways, but um, it did a really great job of balancing like that sense of, I think, you know, hope at the end and also the sense of urgency, right? That the, the crisis that this really is. Um, and so this is kind of a, a problem with all of climate change media in general is this, there's this tendency to either have like a super apocalyptic ending to the story um, or and always end on a, on a happy note right and so I kind of um, I wanted to throw that back to, to the three of you um, around what you think about that you know do we need to have a unhappy ending in order to communicate climate crisis uh, versus something a little bit more uh, uplifting What's your... uh. I know that's a big question <laughs> yes I think it should be all doom and gloom <laughs> no, I, I mean, I, I think a lot of the research on environmental communication shows that precisely apocalyptic rhetoric or trying to communicate the urgency through fear-based emotions isn't as effective, uh, which I'm sure exposure, working in exposure labs, you know that well, and um, the kind of work that you do. Um, on the flip side, having just pure hope is also not probably super helpful to just say, oh, like it can kind of, I mean, a film, it's easy to pick on a film because a film has to have a cathartic moment and at the end you like feel satisfied 
and when you're satisfied, then you're done. You know, emotionally, you can watch Chasing Coral and kind of feel like, all right, I'm finished because they, I see, I end, and I see Zachary Ray go in there with the kids, and awesome, I'm gonna go home. <laughs> I'll be done with it. Uh, not saying that like the film isn't inspiring in ways. That's just kind of the nature of it. So I do think you know you need. Oops. Um, I do think that you need you need both of them uh, in a way. Um, I think one of the ways to think about that is you know the the scene that really strikes me in the film is when they're at the floating restaurant or the floating party boat and they're diving down. Um, that's where you see the. I, the term is epideictic rhetoric, which is praise and blame rhetoric, um, which happens a lot in this movie. And he talks about blaming people, and he says, you can't blame the people on the boat, um, because they're representative of kind of all of humanity. Um, which kind of, that's the, I think the maybe unaddressed question in the film is, who is to blame? Is it just kind of the generalized public, all of us in general? Um, or is it, you know, who it actually is, which there are certain political actors and countries that are exponentially benefiting from the continued release of fossil fuels. Um, so I think that maybe could be another element. Maybe, I don't know if that's anger, I guess, is another <laughs> thing to throw in there instead of fear and hope. Maybe throw in a little anger could help, I don't know. Yeah, interesting. I think for, to me, I guess my perspective is similar to yours of a balance. I think if there's no hope, ever expressive of it, then it's, my view is like, well, why should we care even then? If there's never going to be a chance to ever save this thing, why care? But if you don't express that there is some dire urgency to do action, then it's like, well, if it's not immediate, it can wait. It's, you know, maybe another time. And so there's no motive to keep going. Um, and I think some of that doomsday stuff helps push towards that motive of actually doing action. Um, but if you're like, any action I do has no impact, then that is likewise not going to spur any action. Yeah, I, shocker, agree. I think it should be a hybrid of both. Um, I think the key element in not making people shut down when you have something that is like, these corals are going to die, they are dead, they will continue to die, climate change is happening, Zach is upset, like <laughs> all these things. Is, the, is hopefully empowerment at the end of it. Empowerment's like the last the message at the end of the film. And secret, I do still cry every time I watch this movie. I think I've watched it probably 50 times and it gets me every time. So I'm the perfect target audience. But is the, the quote at the end of the film is that it's dedicated to the young people who have the opportunity to make a difference. And I, it's cheesy, but it's very true. It's not just young people though, it's anybody of any age. It's an intergenerational problem that needs an intergenerational solution. And that's a different conversation. But empowering people at the end of something that is inherently upsetting and sad and kind of doomy but has like this happy overtone of like we're doing this together and we're getting this done and we're creating these cameras and like you fall in love with Zach and you love to watch it all unfold I feel like it's a good balance and I didn't make the movie so I can brag on it but I feel like it's a good balance and then it's kind of banking on that people will go to jasoncoral.com or that people will try to seek out ways to get involved in something that's unique about Exposure Labs. Well, not necessarily unique, but something that's special about Exposure Labs is that we're a film and impact company and production house. So we make the film and then we have a film specific impact campaign that comes afterwards. So there was a two to three year impact campaign that followed Chasing Coral and the film is now five years old. And so now I'm sort of carrying over the resources that were built from that, the connections that were built from that. We've created a program that's less coral specific and it's more you know, climate focused, but to, to circle it all back. The hope is that if you don't end on a note of doom and gloom and you don't harp on the doom and gloom, then people won't shut down because we all kind of, I shut down if someone is like, game over, there's nothing you can do. Like you don't feel empowered by that. You don't feel inspired to take action because you feel too small. But if you feel empowered by a message, you feel empowered by a character or maybe like a statistic that gives you hope or scares you, then hopefully you will be filtered into taking action, looking into ways that you can get involved, figuring out how you can help. Because again, if, if it's just fear, you kind of shut down. And I think you were, there's like studies that have been done that are like fear is not the most effective way to get people to take action because it just makes people shut down. So I, I totally agree, a mixture of hope and fear and some empowerment sprinkled in there, um, especially at the end to get people like leaving on a note like I can do something. 
So I'm curious, so you've, you've screened this to countless, to, to a number of audiences, you know, you've seen a lot of the reactions. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what um, the response has been like from, from various communities? I mean, how have people um, reacted to the film and what sorts of things, you know, do they contact you after about, or like how, how, what does that look like? Yeah. Yeah, so I'm managing the Chasing Coral inbox now today and we get emails probably like 10 a week of people being like, I just saw the film, I had no idea, how can I get involved, what can I do? And we have, you know, sort of like canned responses that are like, email this scientist if you're interested, here's how you can get involved, subscribe to this newsletter, go to this place. And so there's things like that where people are getting involved in sort of like a low lift but still impactful way. And then there were also cases where um, Jim Porter, who was actually my advisor in college and also one of the scientists in the early part of the film, um, he had the big, uh, like the sort of, um, overview of the reef and it was in the tiny little pictures and he was sitting in his um, house in, in Florida. Um, but he is an excellent public speaker and gets people super engaged and went to Capitol Hill and wanted to screen the film um, and asked specifically that they screen it after school so that representatives could bring their kids. So they brought their kids, they screened the film and then afterwards he heard back and our team heard back from lots of the aides of um, Congress people and representatives that their kids on the ride home were like, Mom, Dad, why aren't you fixing this problem? Like, what is, what do you, what do you mean you don't know how to fix it? You're in charge, like, can't you do something? Yeah, like, it's sort of like, I don't know, that was a, that's one of my favorite, like, stories to tell, because it's he's like, savvy rhetoric. yeah, oh, he knows, yeah, he knows what he's doing. He's, he's excellent, but, um, yeah, the, the reaction has been, like, overwhelmingly positive, and people have felt empowered by the film and again I still get tons of emails from people I get emails these are my favorite emails but I get emails from like young kids or their parents where they've seen the film and they're like oh my gosh why aren't my friends talking about this I want to like start a choral club at my school and like the parents would be like can you write them a letter of encouragement just so they like don't give up and they don't feel alone like can you you know send them this note can you talk to this school I was like did a panel a couple weeks ago or um, like to get young scientists excited about science and excited about experimentation um, and talking about like how you don't have to be a scientist to get involved in conservation and you it's super interdisciplinary and it has to be like we have to have engineers you have to have politicians you have to have lawyers you have to have people in finance you have to have filmmakers you have to have storytellers blah, 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 blah. you have to have everybody involved or it you know the problem's not going to get solved but generally the reaction is one of hope and um, people are really eager to figure out how they can get involved, which is like the million dollar question. It's like, what can I do? Um, and we have no, we make no <laughs> statement that we have the answer and we're going to solve this problem. But our goal as, as a company is to get people to watch the film, have a positive reaction, which thankfully has been the case most of the time. And then when they come to us and ask, what can we do and how can we help? We have things set up. Are you an educator? Here's how you can bring it to your school. Are you, you know, are you, do you have, are you dive certified? Do you want to take pictures of a reef? Do you have pictures of a reef? Are you interested in, you know, like trying to help people find sort of like bespoke ways that they can get involved, which is also the luxury of having a small team and a full-time staff member me, that is dedicated to answering those emails and talking to people because I can, if someone emails us that's never, like someone from a field that's never asked to be involved before it emails us, we can take the time and like figure out how we can get involved and who to connect them with. So um, yeah, the, the response has been overwhelmingly positive and we've been really like fortunate in that way. And it's just really cool to see that people are still engaged all this time after. It's really heartening and sweet to hear. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we do have the benefit of having someone who's been working on coral restoration. So Thomas, I kind of just wanted to I think, you know, one thing that we're all wondering is, how are the reefs doing now? You know, like, what are some of the things that um, scientists have been doing to, to think about restoring them? And, and since the time the film was released, which is, you know, five, six years ago, right? Um, yeah, what's been happening? What's going on? Uh, well, some of the reefs were shown of Florida, um, and some look just as bad as they did in 2017, some look worse now. Um, but some actually look spectacular. Um, a unique thing of scientists um, and I, that's actually probably a wrong statement. A unique thing of some of the science going on in marine core work is revisiting the same exact spots. Uh, Heron Reef, Lizard Island, uh, South Florida, Bahamas are all super popular spots to do re research. Um, so we're only getting a tiny snapshot of actually what's happening on reefs globally. Um, 
And while a lot of that work is true and predictive of other parts, um, the reason in general, um, we really don't know all that is happening to them. Um, in Florida in particular, they are drastically being affected um, on all fronts. Um, the biggest front is from direct anthropogenic impacts. Um, the reefs that were shown in the documentary are more like fringing and barrier reefs. Um, it's a little bit farther from lands. Florida reefs are intimately tied with it. Um, pretty much most of the structure of South Florida is built on ancient reefs. Um, and so as that water level has receded, the reefs just slowly move down. Um, and because of that, the reefs and their tie to like human and development on land is more direct than with it. And so what we're seeing from this is those extra in, uh, negative impacts from anthropogenic influences are accelerating the bleaching events, are accelerating the death, um, exemplified by these um, warming events, by you know, ocean acidification. Um, Greg Asner um, and some other researchers at ISU just published a great article um, to show in Hawaii that areas that have been impacted by anthropogenic influences, so that could just mean like human runoff, you know, more boat traffic, um, fishing pressures, um, they reacted worse to bleaching events than areas that were less impacted. Um, and so, kind of trying to go back towards the original question, is what we kind of see in Florida is this hodgepodge of all these different influences. Um, and it's really taking a toll on the reefs there. Um, but there is definitely, we're going back to this hope thing of Florida has three reef tiers, generally. Um, first, second, third. And what we're seeing is in this third reef tier, which is deeper, um, farther from shore, um, and being a little bit deeper, it stays a little bit cooler. Um, we're actually seeing a nice refuge for these coral species in the shallower waters um, that are being able to reseed these colonies that are lost. And I think from uh, a government and legislative perspective, bringing that in, is we need to start caring about these areas that are refuges um, for the areas that are being destroyed. Um, right now, a lot of coral protected area is exactly where the corals are being destroyed. And that's important. It's important to protect that, and that's where my work was involved with, is treating disease in this exact spot. But we also need to expand our sites to other areas that can, you know, resupply these corals to areas once they're lost. Wow. I don't know if that answered your question or <laughs> went off on some tangent. That and more, I think. Okay. <laughs> um, I'll ask this last question to Jake, because, uh, you know, being someone who is expert in rhetoric and uh, digital storytelling, you know, in this film we see so many different kinds of, like, media technology, right? We have, um, I don't know what you call it, the, the binocular thing where, you know, you, people are looking around. We have the use of maps. We have animation. Um, so I just kind of wanted to, to get your thoughts on, like, um, some of the, the, the variety of different techniques, <laughs> visual techniques that are used in this film and also just, you know, in other places to, um, to tell stories. And what are some of the affordances of, of using, for instance, like place-based media, GPS, and potentially, um, you know, telling a story in a different way. Yeah, and I like that. So the the, like, the Google Glass at the end with the kids. Yeah, yes. I, I think that was a really interesting one um, because you do kind of need to. That's a thing with environmental communication. It's it's never like a one-time, like rhetorical act. It's like we show people, you know, a reef, and now they care about climate change or this other thing it always has to be told again in new media and so it was interesting at the end with the Google Glass um, and I think one of the the interesting ways it can happen with newer media or play space technologies is through localization and there's some interesting interfaces I don't know if it's made by I can't remember the organization that made it if it's NOAA or someone else where you can use like Google Maps or GIS features to see how climate change will impact like an area that you live in or even where you're currently standing, like through your smartphone or something like that. Um, so I think it's interesting to think about 
how smart, like smartphones, other new technologies can communicate climate change through that localized interface, through those kind of personalized elements, like Haji was talking about, like what does, how might climate change impact me personally, uh, even though maybe I do care about it, um, I think caring can feel overwhelming if it's too abstract or if it's directed at like the world. <laughs> like how do I, I care about the world, but what do I do? I think the caring and doing can kind of maybe meet more when it's like, okay, this is like, I can see this visual interface where floods are gonna rise and the park down the street that I grew up going to is now flooded and it's gone. Or like seeing those future impacts maybe in a more concrete way uh, can, can lead to more of those changes and people feel more politically engaged and like, okay, I can connect with this in some way. Right, bringing the planetary back to the local. Uh, I like it. So I, I think maybe now's a good time to open this up um, to audience questions. And you know, um, feel free to ask any of the panelists questions that we can maybe pass around a mic. Um, yeah, you can also speak loudly if you have a question. Yeah, please. I'm just going to say, like, can you get to, like, a little bit, like, background, like, a little bit screw up, because, like, like, screw up. Um, I grew up in Florida, um, and I do think, I think that kind of, that does definitely shape how I think I connect to the film, in particular, just having, you know, passion for the ocean and, and thinking about the ocean in that way. Um, yeah, I grew up in Alabama, um, which I didn't know this until I had already moved away, but is one of the most biodiverse places in the country and has, um, like, I think the most fish biodiversity in the country. Um, and so I, I don't think when people think about Alabama, they think about the environment, which, you know, fair enough. But it is... <laughs> a really, really biodiverse and important place, like ecologically, and things have already started to shift with climate change. That's the other thing is that like, we talk about climate change in the future, but it's happening right now, and we're not feeling it as much as a lot of people in a lot of like frontline communities that are being more impacted, but it is actively happening. So it's getting hotter, or it's getting colder, or it's flooding, or there's a drought, or you know, what have you, there's more hurricanes. Um, one of the interesting things that I like to think about with climate change and where I grew up is um, trying to relate it to like, old southern men like that's kind of like one of the hardest audiences to try to get to if you can imagine um you can talk about how your fishing is going to change and how your hunting is going to change and those are stereotypes but like they are you know stereotypes for a reason like lots of people love to hunt in the south lots of people love to fish in the south and if you can like again relate it back to those people in a tangible way that's like this isn't just happening in the ocean in florida and you know all over the world this is happening here too um yeah, I don't know, that's kind of how I've seen it show up, where I'm from. Um, I'm from Southern Utah, uh, like St. George specifically. Um, and so yeah, growing up I was very disconnected with, you know, the ocean and reefs and stuff. And right at a young age, I did kind of start falling in love with the ocean world um, from afar. Um, it wasn't until I moved to Florida for you know, undergrad and you know, initial master's work that I really started to see a connection of how these systems do have greater impacts and influences, um, you know, inlands and other, ex other extents.
It's a very cool program. Yeah. <laughs> um, also, really quickly, want to plug. There's a really cool um, tool for taking action, and it's um, through the Can You Hear Us campaign, which we helped collaborate with. Um, if you go on their website, they have a Take Action quiz, and it's like you take the quiz and you fill out your interest areas, the like things that you have connections to, just all these different personal things, and it comes up with like a personalized action plan for you or your area. And they also have a directory of climate groups in your area, and you can just like look up where you are, and it's like super helpful. So. Can, you, can you repeat the name of that one? Please? Yeah, it's the Can You Hear Us campaign. It's run by Yeah Impact, which is a young entertainment activists. They're based in um, LA, and they're a really cool group of people. I think another resource that'd be cool to expose, um, it's called the Allen Core Atlas. Um, and it's a group of researchers um, at ASU and also internationally um, that are mapping the world's coral reefs. And it's continually expanding and now they have a coral bleaching um, app to it. Um, and so you can see what areas have been bleaching, where areas are predicted to bleach. Um, and I feel like that's a nice immediate perspective of being like, hey, here's a link you can go, you can see what's happening, you can see the global extent of coral coral reefs um, because, you know, even personally having done tons of research, being here in like Arizona, it's like, it's hard to visualize the scale of what we're trying to talk about. Um, and so looking at a map, um, to me personally, really helps um, convey this image of the extent that it's impacting. Um, the Allen Core Atlas. So I have one more um, resource. <laughs> um, so Ruth Gates, who was in the film, um, also she unfortunately passed away in 2018. Um, she was incredible. Um, but she narrated a, an interactive documentary called Lost Cities. Um, and it's linked on the Jason Coral website, but it's really cool. And it's like a, it's almost like a, feels like a video game, like choose your own adventure thing, but it has tons of like coral information. Um, but I don't know, something that could be interesting, I feel like, Connecting the dots that if a, let's say a coral reef dies, there is a fishing community that has depended on that reef as a nursery for a fourth of, of ocean life forever. And people in that community now can't rely on the reef for food, for industry, for tourism, for everything. So if maybe if you could like find, I found this is effective of like, and it seems kind of obvious, but like if you can find something that's like a similar parallel in the desert, like if you lose, you know, if if this happens and you can't grow this plant, then you can't have this crop. If this happens, then you can't do this, and you can't do this. Um, like that, that kind of parallel, again, seems obvious, but just like explicitly calling that out has been helpful, um, too. Yeah, if we're in the type of story with those kinds of connections, but I think it's, it's possible to make. Um, even just say, you know, with the Monterey Bay and the fish kind of idea or maybe the choices of what we can eat. I don't think it's just millions of people that are going to be affected. I think it's going to be billions of people that are going to be affected, including anyone in the internet, um, just from the choices of what we can eat and sharing resources. So those are great resources. Thank you so much for sharing them. So what other tools have you found to be effective for storytelling and environmental communication? Like, obviously the film is a great tool, but like what other, I guess, tools could we consider having in our toolbox as far as communicating everything from like with a scientific audience to maybe a more like public audience? What, what sorts of tools are best? Gosh, I don't know. I mean, the, there's so many. Um, again, I think uh, like we're all saying here that the human element of the story is really the most important. I think the the media can be sometimes secondary because um, I think the thing that people are finding is they are there's a lack of agency for an audience if they feel like here's a thing about the environment that's happening that I don't know how to act toward or think about. Um, if that story is told in a way that's actionable, it's you know what's an action that I can take or. Um, that I can think about for if it, whether that action is you know donating or you know learning more um, or you know voting or something like that. Um, I don't know if there's a particular media that, that does that the best. That's kind of the nature of media. They all have their own particular affordances. Film is great for storytelling and yeah, emotional resonance and identification with characters. Infographs are great at condensing scientific information in a way that's easily communicable. So. 
Uh, yeah, I don't know if there's a single one I can think of. Oh, sorry. I can add, add something about this too because, you know, I think um, working in media studies, there's, you know, the, the line often gets re repeated that we don't care about places that are far away from us, but we care a lot about space. <laughs> and space is really far away from us, you know? And I think part of that is that, you know, there's so much storytelling in media that revolves around imagining our futures in space, and so little storytelling that revolves around imagining our futures in the oceans, despite the fact that our oceans are our future, right? Um, so I think that's the, the type of stories that we tell are important too, that, you know, it's not just documentaries and, and realism, right, that matters, but also um, the way that we imagine our environments is important too, yeah. and what they mean to us. Right? Um, a new medium front, kind of what we had discussed earlier in the day, um, especially we're trying to target the younger generations to take action, is to reach them on platforms they're using, TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, um, granted, this is obviously you know, some dangerous terrain of the spread of, you know, maybe the wrong message getting around. Um, but if cultivated in a way that can really slowly start telling the story um, and repeatedly imp imparting this information, could be a powerful media. Um, media is not my expertise, so that's all. <laughs> you guys, you, your thoughts on that? <laughs> yeah, that was a good answer. Um, I, I don't think you're going to like my answer, but it's how I feel. Um, I don't know that there's like one answer, I think we all agree on that, but it's just so nuanced to try to connect climate to individual groups. So having the capacity through, I'm using a lot of buzzwords, having the capacity through intersectionality to focus in on how best to communicate with the audience that you're trying to reach and meeting them where they are instead of trying to get them to meet you where you are is really effective. And then getting people to, like, let's say there's um, a community, like, frontline communities often have solutions in mind or they've, they've been experiencing these things for long enough that they don't necessarily want someone who isn't from their community to come in and tell them what they should do. Um, so including people in the conversation to be like, what do you think we should do? How, how have you felt about this? How is this impacting you? And not just in like an egocentric way to make people care because it's about them, but in a way where you can connect it to your own life that doesn't have to be state by state and doesn't have to be ecosystem by ecosystem. But if I'm saying the beaches I grew up going to are disappearing and someone can be like, how does that make you feel? Sad. Well, I don't know what to do about it, but what if we did this? Or like if someone proposes a solution and I think that wouldn't work because I'm from that community and I know how they're going to react to it. Like having space for dialogue I think is important. But the overall answer is just that like it's so nuanced for every ecosystem, for every community, for every individual. It's hard to have a one size fits all solution, which is why it's like really exciting that the climate space and like eco storytelling space is becoming, it's always been intersectional, but it's becoming mainstream intersectional finally, and people are beginning, being given a platform and being resourced to do this work that I'm talking about. Um, so having a mixture of voices to talk to a mixture of people has been, is very effective. Um, it's a little harder to like put into a, you know, like bite size action, um, but yeah. Um, I don't think that directly answers that question, but there's um, the Coral Reef Alliance, um, acronym Coral. Um, they have a few few partnerships around the world, but one is in Hawaii and working with indigenous and native people, native Hawaiians, um, to bring the cultural significance of reefs and artisanal fisheries there um, and try to tell their story and their connection to the reefs, to you know, some of the local governments. Um, I don't know if that directly answers your thing, but that is one case I know of of some alliances trying to work with you know the indigenous people. Yeah. Um, I think that's a great question. 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 I think that
I feel like it's a symptom of the, um, the system that my answer is not really. Um, it's also not, I mean, it's not my expertise, but um, yeah, I, one that comes to mind, and it's not necessarily an indigenous group, but it is like local action focused and like bringing resources into a place and distributing those resources to the locals rather than coming in and being extractive with the practice. So um, I believe, if I'm, if I'm mistaken, I'll correct myself after this, but um, I believe they're called Revolution Foundation. So it's like revolution, but reef. Um, and I am blanking on where they're based right now, um, but they basically like to start, went in and talked to the locals and talked about coral restoration um, and like coral like guardianship um, and have now trained some people and then that community has like built itself up and employed locals to be like coral guardians and um, coral gardeners which is cool and there's a couple of different efforts happening like that um, but yeah that was just what came to mind I think I can speak to this a little bit um, because it's a it's a really big aspect of the field that I work in which is the blue humanities um, to think about indigenous knowledges and what their relationships are to oceanography at large and Western science at large. And you know, I think one of the things that is a struggle is this idea that um, there's a big global system that everyone needs to be a part of, and we just need to integrate people into that system uh, because that's an assimilationist perspective, right? And not all forms of knowledge share the same platforms of documentation. That knowledge, and indigenous knowledges might you know, be uh, passed down orally, there might be passed down through different kinds, through storytelling, through different kinds of mediums, right? And so I do think that there has been, um, at least that I have seen in the last couple of years, a more concerted effort to really listen and to think about what it means to um, co-produce knowledge with indigenous communities. Um, I was at uh, Ocean Ops, uh, which is like a global massive oceanography conference, I'm sure you know of it, um, in 2019, and it was the first year that they had brought in um, indigenous participants to that conference, and in a in a you know central way, and they were talking to this you know giant group of oceanographers um, about their perspective. And so I do think that that increasingly I see that a lot more in environmental um, you know uh, studies in general, but particularly like working in the humanities. One of the most important things is is using that knowledge that we have in the humanities with knowledge that scientists have, right? And I think here at ASU, you know, that's definitely happening, but um, in other places too, you see a lot more of that cross-disciplinary perspective. Well, Lisa, I want to ask you something because I think it's related a bit to your research, which, so I started thinking about this, and I don't know how much it applies exactly to this film, but maybe you can speak to it more broadly, which is, how the use of these technologies, right? Like watching these cameras be put, um, you know, down under the ocean, um, what that both enables in terms of, of us to obviously better see what is actually happening and therefore be moved to make change, but then also what are potentially some of the ways in which those very technologies are also harmful, perhaps? Well, the thing with technology is that it can always be used for a variety of purposes, right? And so, I mean, um, right now, I think there's a lot of energy directed towards um, developing ocean observation in a long-term way. Um, so, like the the need, there's a need to understand like large-scale interactions between um, different areas. There's a need to understand long temporalities, right? And so, there has been a lot of technologies developed that. Um, you know, are intended to stay at stay in the ocean for a long time, similar to kind of what um, they're showing in this film, right? Uh, except for, you know, it's kind of developed more than that now. Um, but at the same time, you know, oil and gas industry, um, governments, they're interested in those technologies too. And it's never, it's never a simple thing to, to create technologies that will surveil and observe a space when, especially if that space is of geopolitical interest, right? Um, or has ties to other things. So I think one of the, I mean, maybe Thomas can speak to this too, but one of the issues that I see, uh, particularly in our oceans and deeper oceans, is this problem of transparency, this lack of access 
to the data that is being collected, or the idea that you know a lot of the, the ways in which this technology is funded is through industries that you know have a stake in that do not have a stake in um, protecting those environments, but are really more interested in profiting from them, right? Um, so I think the more that we can, as you know, a public, be aware of the things that are going on um, and demand transparency, because that's that's like a really important thing that you know doesn't necessarily get talked about again, because the oceans is, are of course out of sight, out of mind for most of us. Um, then the, the the better it is, and the more international cooperation there is, the better too, right? Um, so I don't know, maybe you can also <laughs> um. have perspective on that one, but. On some transparency for um, maybe some of the deeper ocean stuff, um, my master's thesis, um, <clears throat> Rosanna Milligan, um, brilliant scientist, um, she was working with some researchers on a project called Deep End, and their work was to kind of catalog the ecological um, effects of deep water horizon. Um, and it had pretty much had never been done before, of, at least to the scale. And so they kept doing research cruises, uh, huge nets, um, you know, 50 plus meters long, um, just going down to like a thousand meters of depth, coming up, taking these fish, um, and starting to see this trend. Um, but that is, that takes a lot of resources. The cruises are super expensive to process all this data. Um, and so the need to actually have some of these longer term observations um, at depth, at, you know, at surface, um, really could provide a more impactful story. Because um, initially, you know, BP was fined, I don't know the exact amount, um, but for ecological damages. But now through this ongoing process, um, Deep End, the nearest one is called Restore, um, we've realized that we knew so little of the ecology of that system um, that the price tag we had put on it at the time was vastly um, undersold or it's much more expensive than we had anticipated. Um, and I think that's the power of some of these long temporal stuff is to really help see the value of it at scale over time. Any other lingering questions? Yeah. So I've been trying I've been trying to formulate my question. It's just, I feel like mine is just so complex. So this is actually gonna be more of a personal question. So I know the film uh, highlights a lot that there is you know, this gap. And this gap has existed for a long time. And the gap I'm referring to is, you know, the, the uh, a scientist is, is trained uh, to think a certain way, you know, versus the general public, you know, uh, sort of like a, a I can think of, sorry, not a scientist. I'm, I'm going to use the example of like engineer because that's the person that pops into mind uh, when it comes to like designing. So if they're taught to design um, something a certain way, uh, but they don't understand, as you guys uh, kind of all mentioned, you know, the human, you know, aspect to it, which which is now we're seeing efforts of like the merging of like storytelling and um, you know meeting scientists to be able to you know bring awareness to these issues and stuff. So. Um, a lot of like what we talk about is, uh, or that is talked about is like kind of like what ifs, you know, like you know with that sense of hope in mind and stuff. And um, personally, through your research and stuff, I just wanted to see if that gap um, is kind of narrowing between the average person and like you know like who is the target audience of this awareness and the scientists, you know. Are the efforts, you know, that you know these storytellers and like you know um, scientists are doing, kind of meeting and actually making, you know, a difference or an impact? Um, I know it's such a complex question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry, um, but I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think it does. Um, I mean, I think that from polls, it shows more and more people are concerned about climate change, and young people disproportionately more concerned about climate change, which makes sense. So, I mean, I don't know if that's all due to chasing coral, probably some of it, um, <laughs> but probably due to the publicized efforts, and like they mentioned, and I think it was, they showed like clips, footage from like uh, an NBC interview in like the 90s of 
maybe this is climate change, and then the guy was getting all that pushback, even from other scientists. Um, which seems wild now, where climate change is in the news almost every week. It has become more, more regular and persistent, and so I think the, that's part of maybe the gap meeting, is just the, the scientific consensus maybe grew a little bit more accepted, and then um, can be more, more accepted by the general public. But again, the question of what, what to do. Yeah, I'm so sorry. Yeah, no, I, I was actually going to mention that because, um, you know, you have um, a lot of, like, um, in these same, you know, mediums, as you were talking about, like, uh, with, uh, that are prevalent today with, like, for example, these platforms like TikTok and stuff, but we try uh, using them for, like, you know, good, you know, uh, pushing, you know, um, awareness and stuff. Um, do you think that, um, Sometimes we hear that the, the internet, in a way, is a fact, you know. Um, do, do you think that can be kind of taken into consideration? Sorry, I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> but basically, what I was going to say, I, I was thinking this because you guys were saying it. I was like, okay, like, do you think that maybe now it's just becoming more kind of like a, a dialogue that really has no meaning behind it. It's kind of like everyday talk. Like, oh yeah, it's just like, kind of like you were saying, like, climate change is like, you know, in the news, like, but the severity of climate change is, it's just becoming part of like our everyday dialogue, that type of thing. Sorry, that came to my mind. Like, people, so like people are numb to it at this point. Almost. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's what I was, yeah. That's a good question. Um, I think this kind of, in my perspective, immediately goes back to like the, the doom and gloom and the hope um, perspective of at some point, whatever ratio we have of doom to hope, um, maybe this numbness starts coming in. Um, but you need something to rejuvenate the interest in it. Um, let's say like in your yard, you always keep passing the same tree, the same shrubs, going to your car, going to work. Um, and then one day, you know, maybe like a branch falls down after a big storm, and something looks different. We need things to keep it dynamic, um, to keep it changing. Um, and I think a part of that is continued science. Um, we need researchers to do actual science and to be willing to communicate to storytellers um, that can put in a way to rejuvenate the story, to keep it present. I think it's important that it's always on the mind but if it's always on the mind, it can easily become lost and um, kind of push back. Yeah, um, I'll, I totally agree, and I'll add um, that, and this, this is a road that we're gonna go on to get to my point, so stick with me. Mm -hmm. But, so, one of the um, fundamental characteristics of capitalism is individualism, and focus on the self and like a scarcity mindset, um, which kind of puts us into this mentality of like, I have to fix this problem, or I have to get one person to fix this problem, you know what I mean? Like, you're, we're putting that on ourselves. Um, so we kind of, like, we release emphasis on collective knowledge and collective action and collective momentum. Um, because yes, while Gen Z, especially, I am part of Gen Z, we make so many jokes about climate change, we're all like, haha, funny, it doesn't matter. All of us know that it does matter. Everybody in this room came into the room tonight knowing what climate change is. And if you heard, let's say, a politician talking about how they didn't believe in climate change or how they thought that it didn't matter or they were actively spreading false information, you'd be able to spot that because of this like sort of like hive mind about climate change that we now have and this like awareness that all of us have now. And I say all of us, I mean that's that's a very bold statement to say that everybody's on board, obviously we know that they're not. But I think there is power in it being kind of just like a household conversation and it's something that you say in passing because it means that there's always an awareness of it in the back of your mind. You're always thinking, even if you don't think about it, you're subconsciously thinking, this has to do with climate change. You see a hurricane that's gotten worse, you know that that has to do with climate change. And you might not say that out loud, but you know that and like people know that. So that when you see a politician, again, you see someone that you're gonna vote for say something that you that is climate denying or that's anti-environment or is pro-oil, pro-fossil fuel, you're probably less likely to vote for them if you care about climate change and you know about it. You know what I mean? So like the this sort of collective acceptance and not necessarily like 
always being outraged and always feeling like you're in a hole of doom and gloom, I think can be good. Like it, in the ways that it can be bad, it can also be good because if it's always in the back of your mind, even if you've kind of accepted it just as a way to cope with, because climate anxiety is now, it was put in the DSM-5 as like a genuine mental disorder that now people have because it is so prevalent all the time. But the flip of that is that it is so prevalent all the time that it's gonna come up in any conversation and people are people who are informed can then make connections with things that folks who may not be as informed wouldn't understand or connected to climate change, if that makes sense. It's kind of a roundabout way of being like, it can feel disheartening that it's so casual, but it's kind of important that it's so casual at the same time. I have a lot of thoughts on this. <laughs> First of all, I think MG is 100% correct that it's all about learning how to speak to people in the right language, in their language, right? and centering collective action and the understanding that change doesn't happen quickly. Because I think our media sphere privileges speed, right? Um, in the 80s, like people used to talk about the media focusing event, which is this idea that um, big disaster, you know, big spectacular or disastrous events uh, focus people's energy on large systemic issues. That, that we don't really care about things until something really crazy happens, right? Now we live in an era where when something crazy happens, <laughs> whether that's like a hurricane or some, you know, uh, some disaster like you know, a global coral bleaching event, um, it doesn't necessarily drive action in the same way. It drives explosions of discourse that may or may not translate into action. And so really, I think we put too much emphasis on shock and outrage, right? Because those are things that, um, don't stand the test of time. The things that do really matter to people are things that affect them on the ground. You know, their sense of identity as a community, um, as as people, <laughs> um, their livelihoods, and those are the things that are going to continue to matter. You know, no matter what. So that that's my my perspective on it. But you know, again, like climate denialism. There's a lot that goes into that. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of different things that impact why someone chooses you know, climate di denialism. And, and to some extent, maybe it's not that useful for us to engage you know, with the... All right. Great. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all. To our panelists for joining us today, and thank you all the audience for your questions.